Yuma and welcome. I'm Phil McAuliffe. I'm the loneliness guy and this is Connection Over Coffee. This is a podcast that proudly serves and supports you, a gay man experiencing loneliness and helps you take steps to getting the authentic connection that you need and deserve. It's also proudly recorded, edited and uploaded in Canberra, Australia's capital city, on Ngunnawal country and I humbly acknowledge and pay my respects to Ngunnawal elders past, present and emerging. And I also want to acknowledge and welcome all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and other First Nations peoples listening. Thanks so much for joining me. Please go make yourself comfortable and I'll go get us some coffees. Hello YouTube, it's lovely to see you for this episode. And it's also excellent if you've been following here um, uh, on the, like watching Connection Over Copy videos, you'll know that in episode 54, I actually forgot to record the video for, um, for that episode. So it's actually good that I have pressed record on this one. Just checking, yes, it's recording. Um, and I'm really glad that you're here. I hope you're going really well. And let's jump into this episode. This is episode 55 of Connection Over Coffee. In this episode, we'll chat about some of my loneliest times in life so far. And we'll see that there's been a factor that's underpinned, underlined, been present in all of these moments. Indeed, it's a factor that likely underpins and is present at your loneliest times and when you experience loneliness. But we'll get into all of that really shortly. But for now, I've got some important things that I want to share with you. And I say this in a, at the beginning of every episode of Connection Over Coffee and Connection Espresso, and I mean it each and every time that I say it. You're awesome. It takes courage to engage with content on loneliness. So if you're coming back for another coffee and a chat with me, or this is the first time that you've pressed play, I want to say that I see you and I'm really proud of you and I love your courage. And after this episode, be sure to check out thelonelinessguide.com. There's a link in the show notes that will take you straight to my services that guide gay men like you to get the soul nourishing connection that you need and deserve and my services designed to destigmatize loneliness and specifically gay loneliness in this context and it's all there at thelonelinessguide.com and the website is a great place to start if what you're about to hear really lands with you and you want to explore your loneliness uh, from being gay and, well, human and experiencing loneliness because all humans experience loneliness from time to time. And finally, this conversation uh, is going to cover some topics that, well, might trigger you. And I want to make sure that at this point, you're feeling strong and ready to have a kind and honest conversation with me about loneliness and some tough times in my life. And if you're not feeling up to it now or at any time during the conversation, please press pause and come back once you're ready. Remember, the world needs you and you're worthy of love and belonging right now just as you are, and I am worthy of love and belonging right now, just as I am. I'm really glad you're here, so let's jump in. What we're going to be talking about in this episode, as I get a quick sip of tea, it's in the afternoon that I'm recording this, it's a bit too late for coffee for me, but uh, I'm just going to um, get myself together with a sip of tea. I really hope I held the microphone far enough away there so you didn't um, get the sloping noise. But what I want to say is this, this is a really tough conversation for me to have with you. And 
I'm totally down, totally down for having conversations about loneliness. I am totally here for conversations about loneliness as it affects humans. I'm here to talk about loneliness as you've experienced it. I'm here for all of those things. I can speak for hours happily on loneliness, how we can move beyond it, the issues that we face that 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 well speak to the stigma of loneliness and how we as humans can go about working through the stigma of loneliness and talking about it because when we own our loneliness it stops owning us and owning and accepting our loneliness helps us then listen to it to then get the connection that we need which is entirely loneliness's job it's one thing to talk about loneliness in like as a concept outside of ourselves but it's another thing entirely to speak about loneliness as it's experienced within. And I want to say that because this is not an easy thing for me to talk about. It's not easy for me to share my loneliness with you. But I know how important it is because when we hear, when I hear, Still, people talking to me about their loneliness, sharing with me some of the things that they've experienced at their loneliest times, it is an absolute privilege and an honour. Things can get quite intense. Things can get heavy. And that's okay. However, it is really tough to speak about loneliness when it's your loneliness, like when it's my loneliness, I still find it challenging to talk about it. It takes a lot out of me to talk about my loneliness, but I do it because I know how powerful it is, particularly if you are struggling with your loneliness and your loneliness has you thinking thinking and feeling that you are the only person, gay, straight, however you identify as a human, the only person who has thought these thoughts and felt these feelings ever in the history of the world. Loneliness is really good at doing that, making us feel like we are utterly, utterly alone. But I know that when we share our story with people who have earned the right to hear them and receive them without judgment, with curiosity, with all of the things that helps feed connection, powerful things happen. But each and every time it is done by me or you, it takes courage. So I want to say that, that this is not an easy conversation for me to have with you in this episode, but I'm going to do it because I know that it will speak to you. You may see yourself in my life experiences that corresponded with my loneliest times. You might see yourself in them. You definitely will see yourself in them because there is a... As I said in the intro, there's a there's a theme, a, a, a thread that runs through each of these. And that thread is change. I recently did a speaking engagement for Medibank, a private health insurer here in Australia. And Medibank has been sponsoring some fantastic work awareness, work that includes awareness and commissioning research into loneliness and how it affects humans. And part of that research was during this, this panel discussion that I was part of in early March, sharing some data that speaks of when humans, this is in Australia, experience loneliness the most, are most aware of their loneliness. 
and it comes at times of change. Now, this at once was so surprising to me, but absolutely not surprising at all. <laughs> because during the presentation that someone from Medibank gave summarizing the, the information, it was essentially self-evident truths that made, you, made me at least go, oh, that makes so much sense. And as they were talking, I was then reflecting within myself about, oh, when is my, when have been my loneliest times? And sure enough, there they were at times of change. And the idea for this content, the blog post, which I published on the 1st of April, 2023, and this podcast episode that you're listening to right now that had the idea um well the idea was 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 formed in my mind during that presentation so underpinning all of these two points first is well i want to go back just a moment to when i was saying that you know it's tough to talk about our own loneliness but this is the challenge that i give you and when I make presentations to loneliness academics, people who work in public policy, in public health, in mental health, in social well-being, I always give this challenge. It is easier to talk about loneliness in the third person, their loneliness, his loneliness, her loneliness, their loneliness. Loneliness is this, that, and the other thing. It is far tougher and takes far more courage to speak about loneliness in the first person. My loneliness. I experience this. I experience that. But as humans, we relate to the first person more than we do to conversations left in the third person. Loneliness as a concept. Loneliness as a concept experienced by humans is far more powerful than leaving conversations about loneliness in the third person. So it's, that's why I'm doing this. And that's my challenge to you is to take loneliness out from, bring loneliness within and speak about loneliness in the first person. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is about change and reflecting as you do on times when you experience loneliness at times of change. So that change might be the end of a relationship. That change might be the end of a job. That might be moving house, moving cities, moving countries. That might be um, uh, the start of a new relationship or, um, you know, coming out of the closet Coming out as lonely is a pretty lonely experience. Coming out um, and every time you come out or the loneliness of being in the closet, knowing that you have these thoughts and feelings within you, but not being able to share them. Um, or like the loneliness of middle age, the loneliness of getting old, the loneliness of... Um, I think you get my point. <laughs> the loneliness of change, the loneliness of being new parents. And during these times of change in life, that's when the thoughts and feelings of loneliness can make their presence uncomfortably known within you. So I'm sharing this to let you know that you're not alone. The first time that I can really remember being lonely and experience loneliness was, and I share this in the blog post, was when I first went away to boarding school when I was 12 years old. And that was at the start of year seven. And it was 1989. And the boarding school that I went to was uh, about three and a half, four hours drive from my house, from where my parents lived. And it, so it was far, far enough away that I couldn't sort of go home at weekends. And essentially, this realisation occurred to me a few years ago, 
Essentially, I left home when I was 12 years old. I would go home to the place that I grew up um, to visit for a few weeks at a time over school holidays, for summer holidays for six weeks or eight weeks or however long they were, and then a weekend in the middle of term. And that realisation that I left home at 12 and home was ever a place that I could visit but never live at again. Um, well, that's a lot. That's a lot for a 12-year-old, isn't it? And in sharing all of this, there's something that I want to say. Um, well, no, I'll get to that in, in, in just a moment. Back to the experience. So as a child, I, well, I loved nothing more than like vacuuming up information. I would pour absolutely like study hard encyclopedias. I would pick some encyclopedias off the bookshelf um, at home and then just read through it, see what I could learn. And same with atlases, almanacs, the Guinness Book of Records. I just like vacuumed up facts, loved it. And I thought, you know, this was entirely normal. And in my little town um, in regional New South Wales, I grew up in a very small town of under a thousand people. And there were a lot of people, um, well, there weren't many people at all. Um, and in my school class in primary school, there were 10 other kids in my, in my year level and about 90 kids in the school all up. And I was related to many of them. Um, and, you know, it was a place of feeling accepted. Um, and I wasn't really sporty. I loved playing cricket. Um, and, uh, but the other sport that boys played was AFL football, Australian rules football. And I don't enjoy playing that. Um, but that seemed to be the how how someone fit in. And when I went away to boarding school, the school that I went to was, frankly, football mad, Australian rules football mad. And I was suddenly in a dormitory, a dorm with like 30 other 12 and 13-year-olds um, who were seemingly all obsessed with football. I, and if they weren't obsessed, they certainly enjoy it, seemed to enjoy it much more than me. And I was studious. I liked doing schoolwork. I enjoyed school, like learning things and participating in things. But I was a rarity. Um, and most of the other 12-year-olds around me were far more interested in sports or like wrestling or whatever it was that, you know, were, were you know, I think the word that we use is rambunctious. And I wasn't. I was relatively quiet, unless, you know, I felt comfortable. I was relatively quiet. I, you know, enjoyed studying. And I really didn't feel that I fit in. I really did not feel that I belonged. And I shared this in the blog and I was very, I lived in my head a lot as a child. And I had this, 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 and I still do have this enormous imagination. And I, you know, would, would see, you know, taking like the atlases of the Guinness Book of Records or whatever, like I would, I was just absolutely consumed by the thoughts of the outside world, that there was a big wide world out there beyond my immediate surroundings that I really wanted to get into and just know so much about. And part of my living in my imagination, the thing that I, I enjoyed doing as a kid, how I enjoyed playing was to play with Lego. Now, if you're in the US, you might call them Legos, but, you know, in the rest of the world, it's Lego. And I had this enormous Lego town as a child. Well, it was enormous when I was, you know, a child. But um, 
it was I would just spend every day of the weekend there, you know, and and create this like I created this world in my head about what was going on in in this Lego city, in this whole society. And I would just get completely lost in it. And then when I went away to boarding school, like all of a sudden couldn't do that. The thing that helped me sort of, I think in, in today's terms, you know, regulate and, you know, come back to myself, I didn't have that. And so times outside of school, of the classroom were, you know, quite stressful. Uh, as I struggled to fit in and find ways of like regulating within myself. And because I didn't feel that I fit in and, and belonged, I was really lonely. I was really lonely, a 12 year old kid, so homesick, so homesick, like cripplingly homesick for months. I was so lonely. And it wasn't, it, I was so lonely until I decided that I needed to edit myself to fit in. I needed to do stuff, essentially fake it till I make it so I could fit in, that I you know, could make friends or, or, or whatnot. And so I did things that, you know, that sounds very like sinister <laughs> and stuff, but I, I I started doing things that I wouldn't like normally want to do. And that's okay. It's good to, you know, stretch, but it was like, there were things that I needed to do, like, you know, play football in the mud, in the cold, um, that I really sort of hated, but I did it because like I wanted to, to fit in. And this went on for a few years. This wasn't just when I was 12. This is sort of in year seven, year eight, year nine. And then by year nine, like I was 14 and puberty really started to, to, to hit. And that's when I first noticed the thoughts and feelings that, that I might kind of be attracted to men. And when I was 14, I was really bullied. And that was a horrendous experience. And I was bullied by another kid, who another boarder. And so the bullying happened at school and in the house, in the boarding house. Like there was no, um, no respite from it, not even when I was asleep. And I had to sleep essentially with one eye open out of fear. And this... You know, I wanted this to stop. And here's a trigger warning for you. But I attempted suicide when I was 14. Out of desperation for me to finally feel like to, to escape from this place that I really did not feel that I belonged. This is really tough to talk about but I hear so many similar experiences from you wherever you are in the world from around this age there's two things that I want to say here first of all the change that was happening within me was like moving away from home at 12 trying to find my way, trying to fit in, trying to feel that I belonged in this very alien circumstances. And then also puberty as change. And we do things. We've all do we we do things, we've all done things when we were teenagers to try to fit in. And for me, on reflection, that that was really out of desperately wanting to fit in, to feel, well, to fit in, thinking that to fit in was belonging.
The next point that I want to make about this is the on reflection. Now, I'm 46 years old. And this happened when I was 12. So this is 34 years ago right now. And the, the reflection here is a um, is powerful. But I want to say something here. When we reflect, when I reflect back, I'm looking, the temptation is there to look at the circumstances at the time in 1989 when I was 12 years old and look at them through the, the lens, the prism, the perspective of a 46-year-old, highly educated, emotionally intelligent man and look back and go, oh, well, you know, with statements of fact that this was the best, you know, you got a great education. You got a great education. You learned some really good life skills that have set you up, well, for life. You got the opportunity that so many people around the world simply do not have, and that is an education. You know, this is, you know, evidence of, of privilege. This is evidence of all these things that were ab that, that are absolutely true. Moreover, there's the temptation to uh, to remind myself that the alternative to me going to boarding school was a, was pretty much an hour and a half on a bus to school and another hour and a half back five times a week for six years, and so. Boarding school was essentially the only option where I grew up. And so I don't begrudge the decision. Um, and logically, in my head, as a 46-year-old man, I understand. As a 46-year-old man who is a parent, I understand. However, this experience was experienced, was lived by a child who was 12 years old, who was scared, who really, really wanted to fit in, who really, really wanted to feel that he was accepted, that wanted to find someone who was like him, who wanted to feel safe, And so when we look in the review mirror of our lives, we can look back logically, rationally, and go, well, that was the circumstances, what you know, whatever. But within ourselves, within myself, this was experienced when I was this, like I was 12. And so that's how I need to work through these sort of the discomfort right now is essentially bring myself back to the 12 year old bring the 46 year old back to the 12 year old 12 year old rather than another grown up telling the 12 year old within me that this is exactly what you need to do and how you need to fix it that's what makes this tough for me but the loneliness that i felt there was so awful so awful and you know I just took a big, deep breath in. This is hard for me. Because I know that, you know, the people who loved me, who love me, did the best they can with what they had at the time. But gee, it was really hard as the 12-year-old experiencing it. That was the first time that I really experienced loneliness in my life. The next time that I really sort of noticed loneliness was midlife and this was generally around 2016 and I was in my late 30s and my wife my children and I were living in Seoul in South Korea and I was posted there on a diplomatic posting and it was the third time that I'd lived outside of Australia over the preceding 14 years and I like I loved I loved the job. I loved it. And the 14-year-old who was having real trouble with life 
heard about diplomats and thought, yeah, that's something that I want to do. So by the time I was, you know, in my 30s, I was doing that. I was living that life, having those experiences, doing that job, and it was amazing, and I loved it. But I realized that while I was continuing to live my dream and living internationally and representing my country, I was I couldn't escape the thoughts and feelings that I've sort of felt hollow and empty. And it was kind of like my life was a dream. And I was kind of removed from myself, merely observing life and what was going on around me. And felt like life was happening to me, but not really involving me. And I kind of did that whole like checklist, maybe like I did Google. And seeing the, the symptoms of depression, I sort of thought, oh, no, it doesn't feel like none of that really sort of fits. And again, I tried to reason with these thoughts, reason with these feelings that, you know, here I was living my dream with a family who loves me, like, having these amazing life experiences and you know everything on the outside looking like a success so maybe if I just sort of double down and focus on this being success then I'd actually begin to feel it but I didn't I didn't feel it no matter doubling down helped me feel well anything really and so despite how I looked how it looked to the casual observer, the appearances didn't gel, didn't align with the reality. And what was really frustrating to me, what was really frustrating to me, I speak English well. And up until my early, well, late 30s, um, through my life, I'd learned French, German, Spanish, Vietnamese, and Korean. And some of those languages like Spanish and German could speak them really, really, really well. Like I love, love how language works. But frustrating for me, I did not have the words to express how I was feeling and what I was thinking. So I couldn't feel like I could ask for help because how do you ask for help if you don't know how to ask for it, if you don't know the words? And so I noticed these horrible feelings, but I didn't have the words to describe them in a way that would actually, I felt would be meaningful. Not only did I have the, while well, I didn't have the words, and while, well, while I didn't have the words, I had plenty of judgment about myself and that, you know, I was successful. I was living the dream. I shouldn't be feeling this way. But, you know, there I was feeling that way. Whether I shouldn't have been or not, this is how I was thinking and feeling. And, well, it was that time in my life when I sort of began to think that my sexuality, that I kind of kept a lid on, for such a long time in my life. Well, I couldn't really keep the lid on it for too much more. And so I kind of, in response to repressing that part of my life, I was like repressing everything in my life. I was, you know, petrified. I was so scared, not just of my sexuality. I was t terrified of judgment. I was terrified of, you know, being thought of poorly. I was, you know, that someone somewhere in the world would think that I was not a good guy. That sort of desire to be perfect was stopping me from feeling anything. Because obviously I couldn't achieve perfection, but I was getting tired from trying to achieve perfection and didn't think that I could present myself until I was perfect. And so I was in this, 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 this sort of spiral. And all of this 
all of this, like not having the language to express this in a way that wasn't going to hurt people. The person who I loved the most, I was going to hurt the most by sharing like my sexuality with her. I was going to, you know, the, these these sort of simmering thoughts and feelings within me, like was going to upset my family, was going to fundamentally change our kids' lives, was going to change our relationship. Coupled with that, I was, you know, as I said, I was living overseas at the time and, you know, I'd been living a long time overseas and I felt like I didn't have people in my life that I could pick up the phone and talk to. So besides my wife, like I'd pretty much lost contact with friends from university and the other friends who, as I said, like I call this living the diplomatic life they're all bouncing around the world as well. And I might not have seen them for 10 years. And it doesn't really feel to me that, you know, still, this is, this is something that I wrestle with a lot, that I can pick up the phone and go, hey, can you listen to me? I've got something that I want to sort of just sort of get off my chest or, or, or talk about. And I just needed to listen. I felt like I didn't have anyone in my life at that time. And it was that realization, it was that realization when I read an article in the Boston Globe about men experiencing loneliness in middle age, that things started to fall into place for me about loneliness. And this was the change that was happening here was moving into midlife, where the experience of life that I'd had in up until that point was well of limited value for life in the second like in 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 midlife and beyond I needed to have different ways of responding to issues in life I didn't know that at the time. I just kept on doubling down on work, on working out, on trying to be perfect, trying to avoid all the judgment, trying to just do this and be all things to everybody all of the time. I just doubled down. And if it didn't work, I doubled down. It must have been that I'd failed. So I doubled down again. That, that didn't work to how I expected it. Of course, my expectations were completely um, uh, unrealistic. So I doubled down again. That didn't work. Double down again. It must be because I, you know, couldn't do like 120 push-ups instead of 100, or I couldn't deadlift 70 kilos, or, you know, so I've got to do that. That's got to be the focus. And all of those things that I'd used to numb, avoid, weren't working. So I felt trapped, and I felt so utterly, utterly alone until I found some words, any words, and spoke up. And that was the time when I acknowledged my loneliness. And I let other people in. The next time that I really felt that I experienced loneliness was just a few years ago when I came out to live life as a gay man. And my ex-wife and I were living in Wellington in New Zealand at the time. And this is in 2019, in August 2019. And we've been living in Wellington for getting up to 18 months at that stage. And we were there on her diplomatic posting. And while we were in Wellington, I was stay-at-home dad and was writing and podcasting for The Lonely Diplomat. And there's a lot in this that, you know, it's it's not for the world to know, but my wife and I decided that we were going to separate. And we supported each other in an awesome, like, it was tough, don't get me wrong. But we supported each other through that decision. 
But once I decided, you know, once I came out to live life as a gay man, I was really lonely because I was in a city that was not my own and the in a community that was not my own. And the people that I had been friends with were people who up until that point were like me, were married, like married dads um, with, you know, professional jobs. And that social circle disappeared. And if you've ever been through a breakup, you know that there are people who, you know, will, will you know, feel that they need to take sides and rally around one party. They didn't rally around me. And, you know, Wellington's small, so inevitably I'm running to someone at the supermarket or walking down a street. And, you know, it was that whole... Divorce sometimes feels like it's contagious. You don't want to talk about divorce because, well, you know, it's it's deeply personal, but, you know, you don't want it to happen to you. So we just don't tend to talk about things that make us uncomfortable. And so at a time when I really needed people to step up and see how I was going, they all felt like to me that they wanted to give me space or were not on my side in that in that split when like within the split there was that didn't feel like there were sides at all but instead of stepping in they stepped back to give space now if you've ever been um like experienced the death of a loved one you know that this hurts when people will go you know i just want to give you space and that might be true but it's often we give people space because we don't know how to, we don't know what to say. So we don't want to make it worse. So we give someone space. And sometimes space is the worst thing. For me, I desperately needed a hug. I desperately needed a hug. And there was nobody to give me a hug. And that, <laughs> That really hurts. It hurt writing that in the blog and it hurts to talk about that now. There was nobody who could give me a hug. And I didn't know when I came out, because this was not my city, I didn't know any gay men. I didn't know like the community. I didn't know the bars. I didn't know the details of the local scene. And I got on Grinder and started to meet some, some, some men including my awesome partner, Jeff. And I became friends with a great group of um, great, a great group of guys. And over time, I felt like I belonged. But again, because it wasn't my city, it wasn't my country, it wasn't where I was from, I didn't sort of, there was only so, I, I could only belong so much. But I still remember just wanting someone to give me a hug, someone who knew me for longer than a few days or a few weeks to go, it's okay, and to give me a hug. And the last example that I shared in the blog and I wanted to just talk about now, oh, in case the change wasn't, you know, blatantly obvious, in the coming out, while well, that was a time of great change, the end of a relationship, coming out and taking those first steps in life as a gay man. And I will say that I had done an awful lot of work preparing to come out. And I was supported psychologically. I was supported by Mike Campbell, my friend, coach, mentor. And I was like ready, really ready to come out. But that, like, the pain of not getting a hug really sort of sticks. And the final one, as I said, you know, 
thank you for, for, for being with me on this, on this. I really hope that it's speaking with you. But last year, this is the final one. Last year, I quit my job uh, as an Australian public servant. So the career that took me overseas to work in diplomacy, I left it last year. And it was a decision that, well, was a tough decision, but in the end, it was the only decision that I could really make. And I really feel driven, absolutely core of my being driven to do this work on loneliness, to let you know let the world know, but specifically you know that you are not alone in thinking the thoughts and feeling the feelings of loneliness, that you're not broken, that you're human. And to listen to loneliness, to accept and then listen to loneliness because its job is to tell you that you don't have the connection that you need. And it's telling you what connection that you need. It doesn't do it in a very nice way. That's the thing. But I left the job of 23 years, the career that I built, the friendships that I made in over 23 years. I'd grown up. I, I, I joined that organisation um, weeks after finishing university. And I'd grown up in that organisation and, and had some fantastic experiences and met some wonderful people. And I left an office with all the people, frustrations of an office, you know, that, that, that comes with that. But I left that to work on a topic that, frankly, not very many people do like I do. There's a few people in the world who do it, but they're not here. They're not in Canberra, the amazing city that I live in. They're not in Canberra. Sometimes they're not even in Australia. Oftentimes they're in the US, they're in Canada, they're in the UK. And so like, I can't get together with people who understand what it's like to do this work. And there's an irony to working on loneliness it's lonely. And it's a topic that simply by pressing play, you will, you, you're, you're likely well familiar with. Like there's a stigma to it. It takes courage to engage on it. Engage with it, to sit with the concept, to sit with the thoughts, to sit with the feelings. It takes so much courage. And it takes courage to do this work because sometimes like it's, it's not like it's not fun, but it is so necessary. And I feel absolutely called to share my experience, bring my experience and my sort of all the good stuff to bear, to, to, to serve. But there's a loneliness to it. And so the change of career that I had last year, going from the Australian public service as a government worker into solo entrepreneurism has been lonely. However, I will say that I'm really good at reaching out to people who are working on this and starting conversations that in the end we all needed and we're creating the support that we all need so we can in turn support you. However, you know, it is lonely. It is lonely. And many of you, you know, we've got relationships with, you know, I've got a relationship with you as consumers of my message and my work here at the loneliness guy and it's great to connect with you it's absolutely awesome to connect with you and it really does make my day when you reach out to go yes you know this really you know 
this really, you know, helped me, this really supported me because, you know, it helps me feel connected to you. But sometimes it's just nice to have someone in your city where you are to go for a coffee and a chat, right? So they're the four times in my life that I've felt sort of the loneliness. Loneliest. There's been plenty of other times, do not get me wrong. But the thing, the thread that all that binds all of this together is change. Loneliness at times of change is so common. And so one of the things that we now know, and this is the message that I want to give you now, if you are going through change, it is reasonable to expect that loneliness will, will be present in your thoughts and in your feelings. It's fine. Absolutely fine. We know that. And because we know that, we can prepare for it. So you can get the preparation that you feel you need to help you navigate that change, feeling connected, asking for the help and support that you need. And so this, this data, this information provided by through this Medibank-funded study is tremendously important because it means that you know, I can provide advice to you in advance of you going through some change. It helps me meet you to where you are going to be at times of change in life. And life will change. It does. That's what it does. You can try as hard as you can for it to not change, but it changes. So I want to make sure that I'm there ready for you with some um, hints, tips, skills, techniques for you to manage that change in a connected way. And I'm now providing that within myself. I now know how to ask for that support and advice from those around me. So I can navigate times of change in my life in a more connected way as well. So this isn't me sort of sitting on top of, you know, a mountaintop in some kind of monastery going, if you need to do this. Like I'm like absolutely living my life as well, negotiating change, sometimes well, sometimes really badly. But it's important that we all know that we are subject to the human experience and loneliness is absolutely part of the human experience. So if you're negotiating change, when you negotiate change and you are experiencing some of your loneliest times in life, stay tuned. There's going to be some great stuff that's coming for you, but it might already be here by the time you're listening to this check out the services page on my website. And there's a link in the episode description. That will take you there to get you some really, you know, helpful advice and support if you feel that that's something that will support you. So that's it for this episode. Remember, again, I am here to support you through your loneliness and to help you get the soul-nourishing connection that kind of feeling of being loved and belonging that you've been wanting and have been searching for. And it's all through the loneliness And in wrapping up the episode, I want to invite you to join the mailing list. If you're on the mailing list, or once you're on the mailing list, you won't miss any content when it's published and you get exclusive insights into what's happening uh, around the loneliness.guide.com, uh, chiefly through weekly emails, a uh, weekly newsletter. And of course, if you've got any questions for me, got any feedback on this episode or any of the other, what are we, 54 other episodes um, of Connection Over Coffee or the 24 um, Connection Espressos, 
reach out to me on socials or send me an email to connect at thelonelinessguy.com. And if this episode really supported you, made you think, or otherwise had you feeling some kind of feelings, please leave a like, comment, review, share it with people in your network. It really helps me out and feeds the algorithm beast. But more importantly, it really helps to continue conversations about loneliness that destigmatize loneliness and helps people in your social circle know that if they are experiencing loneliness quietly and struggling with it, that you're a safe space to at least begin some conversations that bring some soul nourishing connection. I really appreciate you joining me for coffee today. Yara, and until next time, take care of yourself and together, we're going to learn from your loneliness and use it to get the soul nourishing connection that you need and deserve. Thanks for joining me. Until next time. Bye. Thank you, YouTube. Another great episode. Um, my tea is now very cold but I hope that you got something from that. Of course, of course the, the comment about leaving a like, et cetera, uh, applies to you here on YouTube. All right, thank you so much. Take care and I'll catch you later. As soon as I press stop recording. <laughs>